This program contains true stories of rescues. All of the 911 calls you will hear are real. Whenever possible, the actual people involved have helped us reconstruct the events as they happened. Sometimes a minor mishap can turn an otherwise safe situation into a life or death emergency. I'm William Shaffner. Tonight, true stories of bravery and teamwork on Rescue 911. We begin on July 4th, 1990, as Tom and Gigi Weedock and their two young boys enjoyed a warm summer day at the beach near their home in Mattatuck, New York. We had planned on spending the whole day at the beach. It was very crowded because it was a holiday. It was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Danny and Chris and some other friends decided to dig a hole. They had come out of the water, so I was not keeping my eagle eye on them. But I was glancing over to see where they were playing. Some kids would be digging, then they'd run off and play someplace else. Danny was there constantly, though, digging. Christian noticed his eight-year-old brother Danny was in trouble and alerted their friend Amy. I said, Amy, look, so I went over there and we built the air hole so we could breathe, but the sand kept going in the holes. All the time, I'm keep digging and keep digging. Then his legs start kicking. A family friend, Karen Boxall, had gone over to see what the children were up to. I looked down. What are you guys doing? And they said, we're digging them out. I thought, oh my God, and I started to scream to my sister-in-law and a friend to come over and help me. And they started digging. I tried to pull and realized I could not even budge him. And that's when I called for his father to come over. His legs were totally limp. At first I said, my God, how long has he been on this sand? My first attempt to get him out was unsuccessful. I guess I got into a rage. I said, my God, he's dead. My son is dead. My first reaction was to run and get help, and then I realized I could help myself. I could help Danny. His mouth was full of sand. He was not breathing. And I went to do CPR, and there was no breath in me to give him. At that point then, I went numb. His face was so blue. I thought he was gone. I really did. When we continue, he was just barely breathing. I was scared. I thought this little boy was going to die in front of us. When a sand tunnel that eight-year-old Danny Weedock was digging caved in, it buried him under hundreds of pounds of sand. By the time the boy was pulled out, he had stopped breathing. A bystander ran to call for help. Police and fire emergency, Raina. We have an emergency on the 6B Road Beach. What's the problem? 
Uh, some children were burying a child in the sand. Nobody noticed it. The child is all blue. At a nearby barbecue, volunteer advanced EMT Jerry Diffley was paged to respond to the incident. A call came over as a signal 16, which is an ambulance call. Male youth, unconscious. It's a call always races through your mind. You know, you think about what you're going to come upon. In my mind, I tend to downplay it a little bit. It becomes emotional. At the same time, an ambulance was dispatched from the fire station. I yelled, I, I can do CPR. And then I saw his heart beating through his chest. Thank goodness she was there. I got a breath in. I got a first breath in, and I remember sort of announcing that to everybody, that there was an airway, that it was not totally clogged with sand. I think what kept going through my mind was my CPR instructor, his voice going, it's okay, you can do it. This has got to work. I can't lose him. And then he took a breath on his own. I kind of heard a pop in his chest. His breathing was very irregular and very noisy, and very labored. Did not sound anything like normal breathing. This really can't be happening. Not on our beach, not to somebody I know, not to their son. A policeman and another volunteer EMT had already begun emergency procedures when Jerry arrived and took charge of the scene. When I first got there, we were administering oxygen by forcing air into his lungs. His lung sounds were horrible. You could just hear that there was tons of sand in his lungs. This was an emergency we had never seen before. Most of the area hospitals probably could not handle this. At that point, I realized, and everybody else realized, what a critical patient we had. We're gonna need the helicopter, like, now. Okay, We had never used a helicopter before. We needed to get the helicopter here as quickly as possible. Let's go, boys. Please. He was just barely breathing. It was scary. I thought this little boy was gonna die in front of us. We worked on him as hard and as frantic as we could. Get electrodes. Attaboy. Come on, Dan. Let's try to get his mouth open. See if he can do a modified jaw thrust and get his mouth open a little bit more. All right, let's go back to ventilation. Okay. Let's go with the IV. Let's go. I was very conscious of his father. We always tried to get the parents away a little bit so that we can concentrate on what we were doing. He wanted to stay with his son. Part of my job was also to make him feel comfortable that things were going to be all right, even though deep down I had other thoughts. I felt totally helpless. There's no explaining the feeling. How could this happen? Danny was rushed by ambulance to a nearby school where the helicopter was going to land. His father rode up front. I was too far away from him. And I needed to be in the back, but I knew that they had gotten me to the front to keep me away from him. We didn't have too many more minutes left for this little kid. I guess the thought that went through my mind at that point is, had I made the right decision calling for the helicopter? We thought it was still some minutes away. As soon as we got to the school, you could hear the helicopter coming over the trees. And that was the best sight in the world. They brought Danny out, and I walked over, and I said, please, let me give him a hug and a kiss. And I went over, and I hugged him and kissed him. And I think he opened his eyes for me at that point. I said, Danny, it's Mommy. And he looked at me, and then they took him away. They put him in the helicopter, and he was gone. In those few minutes, he had gotten a lot worse. He had started to go into pulmonary edema. You start drowning in fluid from your lungs. 
I guess I really felt scared at that point and helpless. It was just me. Just me and Danny. All I could do was to breathe for them. I had no idea what they were going to do at the hospital. Thirty minutes after Danny was pulled out of the sand, he arrived at University Hospital in Stony Brook. Pediatric specialist Dr. Phil Ubell was in charge of the emergency room that day. We proceeded to treat him like a drowning. Sand and fluid in Danny's lungs were cutting off his supply of oxygen. They had to suction it out. Even if he survived, he might have already suffered permanent brain damage. Keep doing that. It was real hard to guess how much sand we got out of his lungs, but it looked to be about one to two tablespoons of sand. You don't realize how much you love them until you see them, you know, just laying there. How precious they are to you. Is he... Is he going to be all right? Is he going to be able to do all the things that he loves to do? He turned his head to look at me, and I saw those blue eyes. Oh, it was incredible. Just incredible. I get goosebumps just thinking about it. I think at that point I knew, and no matter what the doctors were going to say to me, I knew he was going to be fine. I knew he was okay. Danny was released from the hospital after only three days. He has suffered no brain damage, and the damage to his lungs was minimal. I think my dad is a hero because he pulled me out of the hole, and Karen's a hero because she gave me CPR, and Christian got help, and Amy got help. It's like really fun, because when people help you, it's like, you should help them when they're in trouble. If you want to dig, don't dig any tunnels. If it's a really deep hole, just don't dig any tunnels in the hole, because what happened to you might happen to me. What happened to me might happen to you. <laughs> Recently, Danny and his parents had a chance to thank Jerry Diffley and the team of rescuers who helped save their son's life. Oh, yeah. I think they're fantastic. I don't know how many times I can say thank you or give them hugs. I mean, they cared so much, especially Jared. I just kept on calling him the miracle kid. Never in my life had I seen any recovery like that. Never. I really think it was teamwork. Everybody worked together, and then that's why this miracle took place. It's a great feeling to know that all the hard work and the dedication pays off. In an instance like this, it, it really pays off. And I'd do it again for another 100 years. Next. My skin's scaring me. Right then and there, I had no idea, but I knew we had to get somebody out there now. Because of the emotion in her voice, I knew she was genuinely scared. Please come quick. On July 29, 1990, in El Cajon, California, dispatcher Debbie Barker began her shift at 6.30 a.m. We normally get disturbance calls and audible alarm calls and that type of thing, barking dogs, loud parties, and kids playing on the phone. But there are times when we get the calls that are completely different. Emergency operator. My, um, my dad's scaring me. He's talking weird. How old are you? Six. Are you there alone with your dad? No, they're divorced and my dad's talking weird. Please come quick. Okay, um, are there any weapons in your house? No. You live at 558. Okay. When she said, my daddy's scaring me, he's talking weird. Right then and there, I had no idea, but I knew we had to get somebody out there now. I didn't care what the problem was at this particular point in time. Because of the emotion in her voice, I knew she was genuinely scared. What's your dad's name? Frank. Frank what? 
I received a radio call, reference a little girl calling on 911. She said her dad was acting real strange. Officer Fred Van Every was sent to the scene. What's your name? Megan. Megan Seckner? Mm-hmm. Ann Seckner. Is your dad drinking today or anything? No. I didn't know if her dad had been hitting her and she had snuck away to call. He maybe was chasing her. I had no idea. Where's your mom? She's at my grandma's house in Temecula. Okay. I feel like I want to walk home. Okay, well, why don't you just stay on the phone with me, and we're going to send someone to talk to you, okay? Does your dad know you're calling us right now? No. Okay. Is he in another room? He, he's in the same room that I am. Okay, he doesn't realize that you're on the telephone with me? He does. He does? But he just doesn't know who you're talking to? Okay. I just want to walk home. Okay, well, we're going to send an officer to talk to you and make sure you're all right, okay? How old is your dad? We try and keep probing and asking and trying to get them to talk a little bit more rather than just freeze up. Mm-hmm. Please come quick. We will. Just, Megan, try and call me out just a little bit, okay? We're going to have officers on the way to your house in just a couple minutes, and they should be there very shortly. Okay, but I want you to stay on the phone with me until we get there, okay? children of my own so I can understand when children are scared you want to try and okay. empathize Could with them the but she wouldn't elaborate on what he was doing to scare her what is drilling me like is he asking you a bunch of questions is that like that no he's just it's like saliva <laughs> oh drooling he's drooling does he need an ambulance yeah I think so you think he needs an ambulance mm-hmm. stay on the line I'm going to transfer the paramedics don't uh-huh. hang up okay Megan I explained the situation to them, told them we were already on the way, that I was still going to keep her on the line with me until we got there. Medical aid, unknown problem. Channel Heartland for truck 6, medic 6 2. Rescue units from the El Cajon Fire Department were dispatched to the scene without any further information on the problem. On the way to the call, you're always thinking about what it could be. We weren't sure what we had. Okay, Megan. Don't hang up, okay, honey? You can talk to her, yeah, I'm going to keep her on the line. Megan? What? Okay, we're going to send a paramedic to check on your daddy and make sure he's okay, okay? I want my mom. Okay, I know you want your mommy, and I know you're really scared right now, but you're doing a really good job, and if you can just stay on the phone and talk to me for a couple of minutes, that'll be great. Okay, Megan? If you hear somebody knock on the door, I want you to go answer it. It'll be one of the officers coming to see you and make sure you're okay, all right? Okay. You did a really good job. You know, that's really great that you called when you were worried about your dad and when you were scared. And that's what 911's for. Okay? Okay, sweetheart. I would hang up. I know you do, sweetheart, but I would really appreciate it if you could just talk to me just for a couple more minutes, okay? What's your daddy doing right now? He's just sitting on the couch? Okay. He doesn't have any, like, beer bottles. Within three minutes of the call, Officer Van Every arrived on the scene. Has he been drinking anything at all? Like, does he have a glass of water or anything? He's there. Okay, you answer the door. Don't hang up, okay? Just leave the phone off the hook. What's the matter with him? I don't know. Sir, wake up. Sir? I thought he was dead when I first got there. His eyes were closed, and he's laying still. And, uh, I can really see any uh, respiration at that time. I wanted to see the policeman because I knew he would help my daddy. I checked his pupils, which were unresponsive. I tried to shake him, to wake him up, and talk to him, and he got no response. Fire department EMTs arrived soon after the officer. Frank, 
Can you hear me, sir? What do you got? I don't know. He's got a slide. What's his name? Frank. 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 You understand me? Frank. The little girl's real scared, uh, real worried about her dad. Cougar, you get the VP, I'll get the O2. Gotcha. She had uh, no one really there to support her, except strangers. Within two more minutes, the advanced life support units got to Frank Seckner's apartment. Okay, we got a medical alert tag here. What's it say? He's uh, diabetic. Get you a pulse in a minute here. As soon as we arrived, truck captain uh, was relaying information. Yeah, we have a diabetic. He's unconscious right now. Forty-nine-year-old Frank Seckner was in a diabetic coma. Paramedic Dave Rickards and his partner took charge of his care. When we first came to the door and saw Frank, it looked like he was in a deep unconscious state. He's unresponsive to painful stimuli, Dave. We noticed Megan over on the side, and she was terrified because she didn't know what has happened to her dad. Yeah, that's what his medical alert takes. Okay, did you find any insulin in the refrigerator? I checked. We went ahead and did a blood glucose analysis and that told us that his blood sugar was real low. In fact, Frank's blood sugar was so low it didn't register on her machine at that point. Frank's condition was pretty serious. Hey Dave, I have an IV established with a uh, 18 gauge to the left AC. He's got sinus attack without activation. Okay. Let me, Let me add that blood glucose, and I'll go ahead and start that. Okay. We went ahead and gave him some uh, dextrose. And what that does is kind of like a uh, large loading dose of sugar. And it goes right to the brain and starts the brain's functions back. Okay, D50 is on board. Frank, can you hear us yet? He's got some eyes are fluttering there. As he was coming out of his unconscious state, we are beginning to ask him, did you hurt anywhere? Um, what day is it? and he was a little slow to respond at first. He uh, was still a little on the disoriented side, but after a few moments uh, of awakening, getting some more juice into his system, um, he was able to answer all our questions. He was back to normal. Less than 10 minutes had passed since the first help arrived. When he was aware of his surroundings, he was thinking, hey, where's my daughter? Yeah, okay. Well, your daddy's all better now. Would you like to go talk to him? Okay, Megan. Let's go and talk to him. You go with him, Megan. He's going to be real fine, okay? When Megan saw her dad, uh, she just lit up. We let him know that, yeah, Megan was the one that saved her life. My partner, Bob, went down and got a, uh, what we call a comfort teddy bear. And once she saw that uh, her dad was okay, I think the, the teddy bear kind of clenched it for her, and she felt safe at that point. Pretty special. Frank Seckner is alive today thanks to his daughter, Megan, and his former wife, Lynn, who taught their little girl how to call 911. I was just really grieved that I wasn't there when she needed me. That was my first reaction, was that I hadn't been there and she had gone through something really horrible by herself. Then I felt just a real pride that she had done what she needed to do to take care of herself and to save her dad. Putting anybody through an, an experience like that is just uh, it just tears at, the, at your insides, you know. It's just something that uh, you don't want to put anybody through, especially a child, especially your child. Even though I was scared, I was happy when the lady answered the phone. All parents should teach their children to call 911. She did something that was just very, very special. She, uh, she would, she's a hero. Next. I observed a vehicle was sharply veered in front of traffic towards the police cruiser. Lieutenant Jim Pucci was a 20-year veteran of the Greenwich, Connecticut Police Department. Well-liked and well-respected. On the night of January 19th, 1988, he and his fellow officers were called to the scene of an accident. 
found an accident involving a flatbed tractor trailer truck and a small type vehicle. Uh, the small vehicle was pretty much underneath the flatbed portion of the truck. Uh, the situation was hazardous for both myself and the vehicles up there. Sergeant Pat Chilla was the first officer on the scene. There were vehicles passing me at a high rate of speed on both my right and my left. So we start setting up a flare pattern to protect the scene. Officer Gary Hanulik was helping to control the traffic. Headquarters notified me on the air to tell me to go qualify. We had our shooting program that was taking place. Veteran Lieutenant Jim Pucci arrived to take Officer Hanulik's place, laying down warning flares on the roadway. The non-injury accident had occurred on a three-lane stretch of highway, reducing traffic to one lane and speeds to under 10 miles an hour. I've known Jim Pucci for approximately 15 years. Uh, when I became a police officer, uh, we became friends, and we've been friends ever since. I left the scene and uh, proceeded up to headquarters. I knew of Jimmy as I was growing up in the town. Jimmy was one of the guys you kind of looked up to and wanted to be like. A police detective from the next town over, Dave Piero, was on his way back to headquarters. I was returning from Riverside, Connecticut in my department's unmarked detective car and I was returning to the village of Portchester, New York. observed a vehicle and sharply veered in front of traffic towards the police cruiser. I had seen the impact and I saw the police cruiser being thrown. Get me back up in an ambulance now. I got out of my car and saw that uh, there was a police officer in the trunk of the car. I looked into the trunk and I realized that he had lost his left leg. He was obviously in shock. His face was pale white. Look at me. You'll be all right, Jimmy. Go get some help. You'll be all right. I began talking to the police officer, telling him that, you know, he's not going to die and that he is going to be okay. The words that he kept repeating really hit home. Here's a guy that I really admired, and he's asking me not to let him die. There was no doubt in our minds that if we didn't get Jimmy to the hospital quickly, that he wasn't going to make it. An urgent radio call about a cop down brought Officer Hanulik racing back to the scene, along with other officers in the area. I had no authority there. I just yelled out that we can't wait for this. We can't have a funeral in this trunk. Let's get this man out of here. We picked him up, laid him on the ground. I took off my belt, wrapped it quickly around to act as a tourniquet. The medic unit was not in sight at this time. So we made a decision to put him in the police car and take him to the hospital. The trooper at this point gave Officer Panza the box that had uh, the severed portion of the leg in it. When I saw that car driving away, I knew there, there was only moments between life and death. I felt like someone had reached into my body and was pulling my heart out. Officer Paul O'Gorman had known Jim Pucci for more than 25 years. I remember Jimmy saying things about his family and that he didn't want to die. I just told him to hang in there and we'd have him at the hospital soon enough and uh, not to worry about anything. While Jim Pucci was being rushed the one and a half miles to the hospital, a member of the force was sent to notify his wife, Diana. My daughter said there was a police officer there to see me and I saw Chucky Smith and he just looked sad. 
and I knew something was wrong. He said that uh, Jimmy had been in an accident. Within five minutes, he arrived at the hospital, where a trauma team immediately went to work to try and save his life. Dr. Kevin Conboy was at the hospital that night for a meeting. Well, the initial assessment was that he had an amputation of the one leg, that he had had uh, chest wounds with probable fractured ribs, which is impeding his respirations. He had a fracture of the uh, right arm. He was also having a tremendous amount of abdominal pain, which questioned whether there were internal injuries there at the time. Our major concern was the amount of blood loss. We had estimated initially that he probably had lost close to his total body volume. He showed tremendous fighting power, wanting to stay awake. He was aware of the degree of trauma to his body situation was extremely critical he was aware of it i remember saying i don't care about his leg what else is wrong what's threatening him is he going to die and they wouldn't answer me we knew we had a long stormy course ahead of us not knowing what his lung status would be in the days to follow what his kidney function would be in the days to follow the surgeons were unable to reattach Jim Pucci's leg. They were not even sure he would survive. The doctors came in and they asked me how I was and if they thought I was able to talk to Jimmy. And I said yes. So I, I did go in and I talked to him. I was just so nervous. I kept saying to myself, don't get hysterical. You can't get hysterical. I, I didn't go home. I spent almost two weeks sleeping at the hospital. I came home long enough to take a shower and go back in time to talk to the doctors. The nurses kept saying to me, you have to go home. You have to go home. And I said, I'll go home when you tell me my husband's going to live. When I got there, I was really scared. But I didn't cry when I walked in. I was really strong for my father. And I, I could feel that he was being strong for us, too. Jim Pucci was hospitalized for eight weeks and underwent months of physical therapy to learn to walk with an artificial limb. I think one of the major factors that pulled me through this ordeal is my love of life. I've always loved life and uh, I want to live life to its fullest. I knew that if he had enough strength to live through the accident, he would have enough strength to go back and do the things that he wanted to do. He wasn't going to let this ruin the rest of his life. He had too much pride to let that happen. Our family has always been close. I think that this accident has brought us a lot closer because we've had to learn to deal with some letdowns and help our father along the way. This is something that will uh, be with me for forever. But uh, just thank God Jimmy's here with us. There was a long time there that I, I didn't think uh, he was going to pull through. But uh, look at him today, and it's, it's, it's a miracle. It really is. The driver of the car that struck Lieutenant Pucci had been trying to get around the line of stopped cars. He was convicted of unsafe lane changing and fined $50 anyone gets hero status out of this it should be Jim Pucci because here is a man who came back after losing a leg in a terrible accident never once focusing on any disability that he had only focusing on his abilities one year after the accident Jim Pucci returned to work on the police force part-time I guess it's natural to say why me why did it happen to me but I'm so happy to be alive. I look at every day after that fateful night as a gift. Next. My mom just freaked out. 
and I called 911. My brother ran to Carlin's. She just looked dead. Like most families, the beginning of every day had become a predictable routine for the Rollisons of Port St. Lucie, Florida. But on February 21st, 1987, their orderly routine was shattered. It was early Tuesday morning. Gail Rollison was beginning to get ready for work. The three older kids were in the living room watching TV and Denise was in the adjoining family room playing with the toys. I started the wash and waited till the washer was filled with water. Every single morning at 8 o'clock, I took a shower, and the other kids went to the bus stop at 8.10. As soon as it was done filling up, I said, I'm going to take a shower now. Watch the baby. And no one was specifically in charge of watching the baby. It was just something that I did it every morning. It was like a routine thing. Her husband had already left for work. But Gail was confident her three older children could look after 18-month-old Denise. Gail was in the shower for less than 10 minutes. I saw Denise's chair by the washer, and it's never over there. It was like something come over me and there was something telling me that something's wrong. My mom just freaked out and she did not know what to do at all. And I called 911, my brother ran to Carlin's. She just looked dead. The call for help came in at 8.11 a.m. Okay, how old is the baby? I was home in bed, sleeping. The next thing I knew, Jeremy was just rapping on the windows and called me to come over to the house that something was wrong. Carlin Corp rushed next door to help. From three miles away, paramedics also headed to the scene. From the time a patient stops breathing and the heart stops, between four and six minutes, brain death begins. After 10 minutes of not having CPR done, there is essentially no chance of bringing them back. I just knew I had to do it. I didn't know if I could do it right, if it would help. And I just started doing the CPR. Carlin had not taken a first aid course in years. It's like at first I couldn't remember how to do it. And then I started doing it and pushing on her chest and breathing into her mouth. And then I remembered that you had to tilt the net back. I didn't know if she was going to make it or not. Wait outside for the ambulance to go outside. Her skin was all bubbly and it just looked like different colors, like blue and real deep pink. And her eyes had a very far away look. I remember talking to Gail and telling her to try to calm down. And she kept saying that it was her fault. And I kept saying, no, it wasn't. You know, it was an accident. Within nine minutes of the call for help, paramedic Tim Munson and EMT Greg Sorensen got to the Rollison's house. When I first arrived on the scene, the mother was hysterical. When you see a child just laying there lifeless, it scares you. She was cyanotic. Cyanosis is a discoloration of the skin, usually blue in color. It's brought on by lack of oxygen. 
most of the time. When you see something with that much discoloration, that much cyanosis, you know, chances of bringing it back are almost non-existent. The thing that kept her viable was the neighbor doing CPR. That's what spans the time. She was not only sending the blood around the body by doing the compressions, but she was also breathing for the baby. I picked her up myself and did mouth to mouth out to the truck because by that time we had had a pulse. I felt helpless. Like there was nothing I could do. It was already too late. Okay, bag. We didn't know how long she had been under the water in the washing machine. We don't know Denise, if she had brain damage or not. If you can hear me, squeeze my hand, Denise. Her color started to change within just a few moments of when we started breathing her. Matt, I'm ready to get out of here. It felt like someone died in my family. I don't know why. It just felt like someone died, and I just kept on crying and crying. 11-year-old Tracy blamed herself for the accident. I felt guilty about what happened and everything. I was the oldest. I was the one that was supposed to be responsible of what is going on in the house when my mom's not around. At the local hospital, Denise was examined by Dr. Hamant Gundavna. She was unresponsive, like in coma. She was not breathing on her own. I was almost sure that either she was not going to make it or she was going to be mentally retarded if she did make it. Dr. Gundabda decided to airlift Denise to Shands Hospital's pediatric intensive care unit 200 miles away in Gainesville. There she was treated by the director of the unit, pediatrician Sal Goodwin. Denise, when she first arrived at our hospital, she was in a deep coma. Unquestionably, the biggest problem in a near drowning patient is the degree of brain injury that has occurred as a result of lack of oxygen. In this situation, the odds are very much against a good survival. Dr. Goodwin was forced to prepare Gail and her husband, Dennis, for the possibility that their baby daughter might never come out of the coma. Well, she's a very, very sick little girl. There was a, a sudden point in the conversation where you could see that Denise's mother realized what was happening that all of a sudden this healthy, happy 18-month-old who'd never had a problem in her life was on the verge of uh, dying. I didn't know what to say. I mean, Gail really you know, took it real hard. You know, when you see someone laying there like that, it was just, uh, you're helpless. I couldn't hold her. She wasn't awake but I still had to be there. And I felt like she knew I was there. For two days and two nights, Gail stayed by Denise's bedside. I felt real guilty for what had happened to Denise because I was the one here. I should have been the one responsible for it. Next morning, got up, walked over to the hospital, and Little Denise yelled out, Daddy. Just like was, you know, fine, you know I mean? Not that she was fine, but, you know, she wasn't in a coma anymore. So when she came out of it and she recognized every one of us, then I knew there was nothing wrong with her. She had a favorite blanket she called a Lala, and that's the first thing she wanted was her Lala. So I knew she was all right. Denise was hospitalized for a month with a serious lung disease caused by the laundry detergent she had inhaled. Three years later, she is completely recovered. I think the neighbor, if she would have been there, we would have had nothing to work with, absolutely nothing. Without the neighbor, the child would probably be dead now. It makes me feel good, you know, that she is alive because of what I did. Learn CPR, that's the only lesson I can say.
Anybody that lives near water or pools or has children should know it. Prevention is the name of the game in near drowning. Keeping an eye on children and putting fences around the pools with self-closing latching gates to no basic CPR. It was very scary. I almost drowned. It was a miracle. I don't know how to explain the feeling I had. It was just like the greatest feeling you could imagine. They say miracles don't really happen, but miracles do happen. I saw one. I don't wash clothes anymore. We should all take basic first aid and CPR courses every year. You never know when the life of someone you love may be in your hands. This series is dedicated to all the men and women who answer our calls for help and are there when we need them most. I'm William Shatner. Join us again next week for more true stories on Rescue 911.